Common Sense by Thomas Paine has been chosen by the Library of Congress as one of the 100 books that shaped America. It's also been selected by C-SPAN to feature in our 10-part series of the same name. Common Sense was published in early 1776. It's a 47-page pamphlet written for the people of the 13 American colonies, urging them to declare independence from Great Britain. The work was sold and distributed widely and read aloud in taverns and other meeting places around the colonies. Joining us is Professor Richard Bell of the University of Maryland to talk more about the life of Thomas Paine. Joining us now to discuss the life of Thomas Paine is Richard Bell, professor of history at the University of Maryland. Professor Bell, thank you for joining us. Delighted to be with you. In reading biographies of Thomas Paine, you get the sense that today he's considered sort of a forgotten founding father. Why would that be the case? Yes, I think that's right. Uh, He's not in the central pantheon of our founding fathers, the big six that go from Washington to Franklin and back again. He's somewhere in the second tier. uh, And I think that's probably not a fair approximation of his contributions to the American Revolution, because, as we know, he was the author of, among other things, uh, Common Sense, the pamphlet that helped to promote independence as the primary objective of the American Revolutionary War. Um, But it was what happened in his life and his political convictions after the revolution uh, that brought on a lot of uh, backlash among Americans who toasted him during the war years. So he's fallen out of favor uh, almost from the very beginning, and he's been struggling to claw his way back into the uh, central narrative of the American Revolution ever since. Let's start with his uh, early life, uh, Professor Bell. The story of Thomas Paine begins in England, as we know. What was his life like there, and why did he come to America in the first place? His life was modest. He was born in eastern England, uh, Norfolk, not too far where I'm from in Cambridgeshire, by coincidence, uh, in 1737. His father, Joseph, was a corset maker. He made what are called stays, the sort of ribs of 18th century uh, corsets. And you don't make a ton of money uh, when you make uh, corsets for middling folks in the middle of nowhere in eastern England. So times were hard from the beginning. Uh, Young Tom also had, I think, a difficult relationship with his father, Joseph. And as a young adult, he ran off to the big city. He went to London uh, to try to put some distance between himself and his father. And he tried all sorts of ways to establish himself in and around London. Um, He uh, briefly experimented with corset making himself. He briefly became a teacher. He was a tax collector, an excise man uh, for several years. Uh, years, and he also briefly went to sea as a sailor. And the fact that he's trying all these different career paths is an indication that none of them went terribly well. And you could say the same about his personal life as well. He was married twice while he lived uh, in England. His first wife sadly died in childbirth, um, and his second wife, uh, they separated an early form of divorce in the 1770s. So by about 1774, uh, Tom Paine was living on the south coast of England and didn't have much to show for himself personally or professionally. He had an increasingly antagonistic relationship with authority, whether that was his own father or whether it was his employer, the uh, British government, who he felt as a tax collector was treating him very, very poorly indeed. So when he ran into Benjamin uh, Franklin, who was uh, living in Britain at the time as the chief lobbyist for many of the American colonies, um, Franklin uh, gave him advice to start over in America. And this was advice that a young Tom Paine was only too happy to take. Franklin gave him a very short, generic letter of recommendation, uh, and he put that in his pocket, and he got on a ship for uh, Philadelphia, uh, leaving in 1774. Had Thomas Paine been active at all politically in England, and did he write much? (laughs) 
It's a great question. And the answer is yes. Uh, so we're learning more and more about Tom Paine's career uh, as a writer. Some of that occurred in London, but much of it occurred when he was living on the south coast of England in a town called Lewis, uh, which, uh, believe it or not, had a reputation for political radicalism. It still does today, uh, by the way. And so he fell in with a group of other uh, headstrong uh, young men with political opinions, and they formed a sort of debating uh, society. They called themselves the Headstrong Club, uh, and they would debate political issues of the day. Many of them would write um, uh, what we, we what we think of today as op-eds in local uh, newspapers about political issues, expressing their points of view, sort of crafting their political profiles and consciousness. Young Payne did some of that, though how much he did is hard to know because they all used pen names. And so knowing who the actual author of uh, a piece signed uh, under a pseudonym is sometimes hard. But computer technology, um, AI, etc., is helping us to better understand how certain writing styles indicate authorship these days. So we're pretty sure that Payne was the author of a bunch of um, pen-named pseudonymous uh, political pieces while he was in England, all of which, many of which, I should say, had a strongly anti-authoritarian, um, anti-monarchical bent to them, which, of course, is foreshadowing of the ideology he'll espouse in common sense when he gets to America. So Thomas Paine arrives in Philadelphia. It's late 1774. How did he begin to establish himself in the city and, and, and with what kind of work and how did all of that prepare him for, for the future? Yeah, so the first thing to know is that he arrived sick as a dog. I think he contracted uh, typhoid on the long Atlantic uh, crossing, which sadly was not uncommon. Uh, and he took fully six months to recover his health when he got to Philadelphia. And he did not know a soul, as far as we know. You know, many people who made that voyage were going uh, in what we'd now think of as chain migration to follow uncles and aunts or children or parents who'd already made that journey. That's not true for Payne. Uh, he's going on his own. And so he knows no one. Uh, he only has this little generic short letter of recommendation in his pocket from Ben Franklin, the sort that Franklin passed out to pretty much any Londoner he met on the street uh, and then filled in their name and handed it over. But he uses that uh, connection to Franklin along with his budding skills as a journalist and political commentator um, to begin scribbling a few column inches for a local paper in Philadelphia and then further leverages his Franklin connection to get himself a job editing a new gentleman's literary uh, magazine that was just getting up and running there, and they were looking for an experienced London journalist, and Payne claimed that he was an experienced London journalist, which is a bit of a stretch or an exaggeration, but fake it till you make it, as they say. <laughs> right. So he begins editing this uh, uh, literary journal. It's called the Pennsylvania Magazine. Uh, its proprietor expects it to be non-political and fully literary, but soon enough, over 18 months of editing the Pennsylvania magazine, Payne uh, transforms it into a political uh, journal as well. Uh, and he begins inserting increasingly explicit uh, political pieces into it, uh, all of which uh, are um, positioned as critiques of the British monarchy and the British government's recent innovations, let's say, in taxation policy. And it will be that experience uh, as an editor and writer of the Pennsylvania uh, magazine that will, I think, give him the chops and the confidence to take on a new writing assignment in the fall of 1775 to write a full-scale pamphlet focused on the issue near and dear to his heart, which is uh, critiquing the British monarchy and pushing American colonists to focus their rising frustrations over um, taxation policy uh, to the wards the cause of political independence. And that pamphlet, of course, will be common sense. We are talking with Professor Richard Bell of the University of Maryland about the life of Thomas Paine. So, Professor Bell, take us deeper into those tensions. Describe the tensions with England at the time. 
And was there one or two events that moved Payne to ultimately write Common Sense? What was the spark? Yes. So for Americans, of course, they've been there much longer than Thomas Paine, who just got off the boat in about a year ago in 1774. They are looking back on what more than a decade of rising tensions and frustrations with uh, the British Parliament and the British government. That dates back to the Stamp Act of 1765, um, of course, and is punctuated by familiar episodes like the uh, Townshend duties, the Boston Tea Party, uh, etc. When Payne arrives in 1774, the colonies are in the wake of the Boston Tea Party, and more particularly the British Parliament's response to the Boston Tea Party, the 1774 Coercive Acts, which, among other things, closed the port of Boston to punish Bostonians for the Tea Party. Now, Payne's in Philadelphia, of course, hundreds of miles from Boston, but as many scholars have pointed out, and I'm thinking of T.H. Breen's uh, book when I say this, the months following the passage of the Coercive Acts uh, were some of the most critical in the coming of the revolution because skilled propagandists in Boston, like uh, Paul Revere and Samuel Adams, are able to turn Boston's punishment into the shared burden of all the other American mainland colonies to make folks in Pennsylvania sympathize with Bostonians for the disproportionate punishment they've experienced at the hands of the king and parliament. So Payne is riding a cusp of rising, rapidly rising resentment outside of Boston across the American colonies against the British parliament and against the British king. And he sees which way the political winds are blowing. uh, And he's able to harness that um, discontent and focus it on one particular objective, which is the objective of achieving political separation from Great Britain. I should bring one other name into the conversation for now. It's Dr. Benjamin Rush. Who was he and what was his role in relationship to Thomas Paine and this whole story? Yeah, there's a lot we could say about this, so I'll try to keep this uh, brief. Benjamin Rush uh, is uh, not only a signer of several important documents in American history, but at the time was the most important physician, doctor, public health worker uh, in America at the time. You might compare him to uh, a Dr. Anthony Fauci type figure or a Dr. Sanjay Gupta figure in popular culture um, today, a very famous, um, well-known physician who was also uh, very politically attuned as well. And he and Tom Paine had become fast friends in Philadelphia where Rush lived over the previous um, 18 months that Payne had been editing the Pennsylvania magazine. And so when Payne is proposing to write this uh, pamphlet, and I think he even works up a draft of it, he shows it to his friend Benjamin Rush and says, I'm going to publish this. Watch. Uh, I want to call it I want to call it plain truth, because I'll be talking the plain truth to the folks in Philadelphia about why they should declare their independence. And Rush says um, uh, uh, that he loves the the pamphlet, loves the idea, but that the title needs to change. And it's Benjamin Rush who says, Tom, you should call it common sense, which is remarkably fortuitous because... um, Payne had published a few things in England under the pen name of Common Sense, which is probably what Rush was referring to when he suggested that. But it's also one of the keys to unlocking the genius of the pamphlet itself, because the pamphlet that's named Common Sense, um, it's designed to persuade you of things that you don't currently consider to be common sense, but to make you persuade, but to persuade you that in fact they are intuitive, logical, feasible, necessary, and urgent. So the title was remarkably fitting. We have Ben Rush to thank for that suggestion. Let's talk for uh, one moment here about style. I recently watched a lecture of yours where you said Payne's ideas for the time were radical, but he did his work in common sense in a very simple style. Tell us more. 
Yeah, I think that's right. So ideas for in, Payne is not the first person to suggest political separation, to suggest independence. You can find people here and there suggesting uh, that in other places, in other moments, in the run up to the American Revolutionary War. Um, but Payne is says it much more loudly, first of all, than everyone else, uh, and much. Uh, more cleverly in ways that appeal to ordinary working people, not just, you know, highfalutin natural philosophers and political scientists. Paine's genius, I think, comes from, first of all, his remarkably plain spoken language. You can pick up common sense today uh, and find that it speaks to you in a language that all of us today find to be readable, accessible, and potent and pungent. So uh, his um, directness is particularly radical in that sense. What's also radical is his sense of uh, immediacy. He's not willing to debate whether independence uh, is, um, uh, is the right course forward. He's willing to insist that it is, in fact, the only course forward. Um, This is at a time in the run-up to the Revolutionary War when, of course, no one can see the future. And many people are saying uh, that reconciliation with Great Britain should be the objective of all future political negotiations, that we'd like Britain to address some of our grievances. And if and when they do, we'll go back to being loyal colonial subjects. Payne refuses to accept that course of events and says that now is the moment for immediate political uh, uh, separation, because these problems that the colonists are facing are only going to amplify and replicate and come back and bite us uh, again, even if we settle them now, and that political separation is the only way to achieve a permanent end or break with this long history of British abuses, as he sees it, of the American people. And he's also finally able to focus much of these grievances not on some nebulous thing called Britain or the British government or parliament, but he's able to lay the blame for this train of abuses stretching back more than a decade at the feet of just one individual. And that individual, of course, is King George the third. So his great genius, a genius that Thomas Jefferson will emulate in the Declaration of Independence, uh, is to personify the enemy, uh, to give readers someone to hate. Did Payne fight in the Revolutionary War? Uh, He did in a couple of senses. Uh, The first sense, of course, is that um, when the delegates were meeting in Philadelphia in the spring of 1776, about four or five months after Common Sense was published in January, uh, Payne was moving, traveling with the Continental Army uh, as uh, a soldier in Washington's army, as the Continental Army moved, I think, um, east from Philadelphia on its way towards New York hoping to unseat the uh, British army uh, that was making gains there. That was a pretty disastrous campaign for the Continental Army, unfortunately, and they were driven back, uh, back to Philadelphia, almost with their their tail between their legs. And that would be the moment, by the way, that Payne, who was present at that advance and at that retreat, would write the American Crisis uh, essays, the ones that famously begin, these are the times that try men's souls. So he's on the ground as a soldier at that moment, though his career as a soldier is very short-lived. It's a matter of uh, months, really, in the big scheme of things. And he'll go on to do um, uh, other things to support the American Revolution. I think the American Crisis Essays is his way of fighting the revolution. Common Sense is his first contribution to that fight. The American Crisis Essays, which are remarkably popular with American soldiers and help to boost civilian morale during this dark early campaign of the war. That's his second contribution to fighting the war. And Payne was always a much better writer than he ever was as a soldier. Thomas Payne lived a good number of years after the Revolutionary War. Let's transition, uh, Richard Bell, to what happened to Payne after the war was over. 
many things happened to Tom Paine after the war is over, so I can only sketch out the highlights or lowlights uh, here. Uh, Paine will bounce around. Ironically enough, he will end up back in England uh, in 1787, and he will there write what we might think of as a sequel to Common Sense. It's called uh, The Rights of Man, and uh, one of its goals is to stir in England the same sort of working class political revolution that he'd helped to stir in America with common sense. Uh, That makes him a lot of very important political enemies in England. Um, The prime minister reads the rights of man and um, uh, essentially, you know, sends out soldiers to, uh, to round up and arrest uh, Thomas Paine. He will be tried for seditious libel um, uh, in England, and that trial will force him to flee to France, which is in the throes of the rapidly accelerating French Revolution by that time. Uh, He'll be elected to the French Revolutionary Parliament, representing Calais, despite not actually speaking French. Uh, And he'll have a front row seat to the French Revolution as it becomes increasingly terrifying and violent, uh, crossing a line, the shedding of blood that Tom Paine uh, finds is too far, is too much. He'll write a defense of um, uh, he'll write a critique of the uh, bloodshed of the French Revolution in the early 1790s. That's his third great masterwork. It's called The Age of Reason. And in The Age of Reason, he'll also take on many religious topics, which will make him many enemies among uh, people of faith in England and back in the United uh, States. And he came back to the United States at uh, some point. How did he live out his final years? Uh, In a degree of despair and ignominy, by the time he arrived back in the United States in the early 1800s, um, the nation he'd helped to create had become much more conservative than when he'd left America decades uh, earlier, and also much more religious as well. And his unorthodox religious views uh, therefore meant that he was out of step with the religious mainstream. Uh, He was also out of step with the political uh, mainstream. And his ideas about egalitarianism and democracy uh, were not always welcome in every quarter. So he found it very hard to um, cultivate a public profile that was not at odds with those in power. And he existed on the fringes of American politics, a sort of a metaphorical flame bomb thrower or flamethrower. Uh, his health deteriorated rapidly upon his return to the United uh, States, and he became increasingly uh, isolated and discredited by his political enemies. When he died in, I think, 1809, um, there was a brief memorial service uh, for him, a uh, funeral, if you will. Uh, as far as we know, fewer than 12 people attended, and no political leaders attended that funeral service. Service, which is doubly ironic given that Tom Paine is one of the founders of the independent United States. I have read that Thomas Paine uh, could be considered well ahead of his time in some other areas of his thinking, especially in social reforms. I think I read something about universal income, many of the ideas that we're actually talking about today. Is that the case? That's right, yes. So Tom Paine's most famous works, Common Sense, The Rights of Man, and The Age of uh, Reason, um, do not contain quite the same agenda as some of his other works. But there's a work from his time living in France called Agrarian Justice, which he published in 1797, which takes Tom Paine's ideas about um, uh, democracy and equality and applies them not to politics, but to social welfare. And in Agrarian um, Justice in 1797, Paine lays out um, how to end poverty in the United States or Britain or any other Western democracy. He lays out what we'd now think of as a social welfare uh, program of seven basic uh, entitlements which uh, could prevent the worst ravages of capitalism from driving uh, poor people into early graves. 
So he's thinking here um, about a universal basic uh, income. He's thinking uh, about a job finding program subsidized by the government. He's thinking um, about a f- small um, funeral benefit uh, if your spouse dies and you can't afford to pay for their borrowing. He's thinking about a, a basic pension, for instance. Many of these ideas um, were dismissed as fantasy in the 1790s, but in the 20th century, in the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s, we see many of those exact ideas being taken up by New Deal uh, reformers in the U.S. and their uh, analogs in Britain and France as they create the modern uh, welfare state. So in that sense, you could certainly say that pain was centuries ahead of his time. And finally, Dr. Bell, what do you see as the legacy? of Thomas Paine in American history? So that's a fantastic question. Uh, Tom Paine is an important driver um, of independence as the political objective of the American Revolutionary War, that not reconciliation, not redress of grievances, but political separation and independent nationhood. But also Tom Paine is a voice of conscience. Tom Paine is also hoping that whatever new system of government emerges once political separation is achieved, he's hoping that that system of government will be transparent and accountable and democratic and inclusive. And that is the message he'll continue to beat for the next 30 years, both in the United States, in Britain, and in France, even as it costs him more and more uh, political uh, friends and makes him deeply unpopular. But that commitment to democracy is something I think we should continue to uh, cherish. Richard Bell is a professor of history at the University of Maryland. Thank you very much for talking to us about the life of Thomas Paine. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Books That Shaped America podcast. For more information about the series, you can visit our website, cspan.org slash books that shaped America. And remember to follow this podcast so you never miss an episode.